abilities. Today we're going to be in the second part of the sermon series called Pray. And we are looking at specific prayers that the Apostle Paul prayed. And our goal, I kind of introduced this last week, is that we don't want to be praying simple, safe, general prayers. Uh, we want to be passionate followers of Jesus. And so we want to pray for, for, for big things. We want to pray for God-honoring things. Faith-filled prayers, specific prayers, just as the Apostle Paul prayed. And what's interesting is if you, you study Paul and the letters he writes and the prayers that he writes in those letters, you'll find there's a, a common rhythm to the prayers that he puts in there, that, that he prays for something very specific, and then you'll see frequently then the following words that say, so that, so I'm praying for this, so that. And then he's going to go on then and, and, and show you his desired result. And for example, last week we saw him say, I pray that you would be filled with a power so that Christ may dwell in your inner beings. And every time Paul prays, we see these words, so that, and then so that we'll see this, whatever it is, that end result. And today we're going to be looking at a specific prayer that the Apostle Paul prayed. And it's one, uh, perhaps one of the most important prayers that, that I think we could pray as Christians for one another. That we as Christians could pray for other Christians in love. In fact, uh, let me ask you a question first. If there was a, a, a specific prayer that you could pray for other Jesus followers that would help them have a, a full understanding of every good thing that they have in Christ, how many of you would, would say, yeah, I want to pray that prayer? If you could pray that others would have a full understanding of what they have in Christ, would you be willing to pray that prayer? Would you? Well, today that's what we're going to dig in on, and, and Paul gives that to us. And, and, and while maybe all of you didn't raise your hand, my hope is you would all indeed pray this prayer for, for me and for, for one another as well. Uh, because if you want the Christians in your life that, that you love to have a full understanding of every good thing that they possess by being a follower of Jesus Christ, then what we're going to talk about, you, you should pray for them. And, and, and in that, the thing that you are going to be praying for them is that they would continue to be active in sharing of their faith. Now, why would I say that? Well, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory on, on a little book in the Bible, in the New Testament, a tiny, tiny little book, a book that's called Philemon. Many of you have probably read this. Quick little read. If you want to read, you know, for devotions, a, a quick little book out of the New Testament, this is the one to open to because you'll be through it right like that, right? And, and, and Philemon was, was a short little personal letter that Paul wrote to, to a friend of his. And Philemon was a successful businessman. If you don't know the background of who he was, he was a successful businessman who had been hosting a, a church in his house. So a small home house church every week. People would gather, they'd break bread together, they'd pray for one another, serve in love and, and worship together. Well, along the way somewhere in, in this time that he's doing this, um, he, he's got some slaves and servants and one of them escapes. And it's a, a man by the name of uh, Onesimus. And Onesimus runs away from Philemon. And, and he runs all the way to Rome, where he, in fact, runs into the Apostle Paul. Now, we don't know exactly how all this transpires, how it happens, what goes down. But what we do know is that the Apostle Paul leads this slave into a relationship with Jesus. And because of that, this, this man's life in eternity is radically transformed, of course. And at that point, Onesimus is like, I need to go back to Philemon. I need to go back and, and make things right with him. Jesus has, has changed me, and I need to go and, and, and do the right thing. And so what Paul does then is, is he writes a letter to Philemon, because he, he's a friend of Paul's, and, and he writes this letter vouching for Onesimus. And basically, Philemon, you need to understand this, that, that Jesus has changed this guy's life, and, and, and he's coming back to you, and I want you to receive him as a brother in the Lord, because that's exactly what he is. And so, so Paul, in this short letter, is, is writing a, a very heartfelt, very emotional plea on behalf of this slave whose life has been transformed. 
And so we're going to look at just a, a few couple little portions uh, of that story. And we're going to start in verse 4. If you've got a Bible, feel free to open up to that. We're going to be in verses 4, 5, and 6 today. And if you don't have a Bible, there's some in the chairs. Feel free to open up U version on your phone. It's perfectly fine as well. And, and we're going to start in verse 4. And, and this is what Paul uh, says to his buddy Philemon. He says, I always thank God as I remember you in my prayers. Then he says this, I, I thank him for two reasons. One is, because I hear about your faith in the Lord Jesus. And the second reason, he says, is it's because of your love for all of the saints. Now I want you to think about this. I thank God, Philemon, because I hear you love other Christians in such a beautiful, beautiful way. I thank God because of your faith in Jesus, because you have a, a, a deep love for other Jesus followers. And then down in, in verse 6, this is what Paul prays. He says, I pray that you may be active in sharing your faith. Why? Don't miss this. So that you will have a full understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. See, it would appear here that, that, that perhaps Paul has maybe discovered a, a blind spot in Philemon's faith. You see, I mean, he's a leader of a local church, right? I mean, he's got a church meeting in his house. Quite likely, he's possibly even been leading others to Christ. But it, it, it would seem that he hasn't literally shared his faith with this man who works directly for him. So it seems that, that, that Paul here is, is kind of gently pointing out, out that, 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 that blind spot to Philemon. And instead of beating him up over it, he tries to encourage him in it. And, and the reason I think that perhaps Paul was doing this is, is because he knew it was true for them then as, as much as it is true for us today that, that one of the most dangerous places for us as Christians to get to is where we become inward looking and, and self-centered in our vision and version of Christianity. Where instead of loving others who are far from God, we begin to judge those who are far from God. Instead of having an attitude of trying to reach out, we can fall into the the, the, the problem of having an attitude of trying to retreat and run from non-believers. And then what happens is before long then, a lot of people become kind of like, well then stay away from the big bad world, right? The world is bad, stay away from those people. They're, they're non-Christians, right? They're the ones that watch all the R-rated movies and listen to secular music and their kids watch cartoons that, whoa, we would have never watched those when we were kids, right? Well, they're not Christians. They, they don't live by our standards and rules, right? But we're like, no, 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 stay away. And we, 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 we create this Christian bubble. And if we're not careful, we just live in that bubble. And we don't have interactions with the world outside. There's, there's a, it's called retreatism. This, this run and hide kind of thing, right? But here's the deal. The, the, the last things that, that Jesus spoke about before he ascended into heaven wasn't, hey, Christians, go hide in your house and avoid the world, right? Remember that passage? Where did Jesus say that? Anybody? No. What he said is, go into the world and shine. He said, go into the world, preach the gospel, baptize people in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples of them, Right? He said, you are the salt of the earth, the light of the world. You don't run from darkness. You shine into darkness as a believer. Yet, how often is Philemon's problem our own problem as well? I mean, intellectually, we know it's important to share our faith, right? Right? But did you do it in the last seven days? Did you share your faith in the last ten days? Who shared their faith in the last month, right? We know, yeah, oh yeah, pastor, we're supposed to share our faith. But are we doing it? You see, we have this problem too. 
We, we don't share our faith like we should. So we need to pray for one another on this. We need to encourage one another to do this. Why don't we share our faith? Well, there's, of course, a number of reasons. And I think one of the reasons is, frankly, we just get busy, right? I mean, life happens. Monday, we had basketball and Cub Scouts. Tuesday, I had a church meeting. Wednesday, I've got Bible study. I've got praise team practice. I've got kid men. I've got to drive kids from home, home after church. Thursday, basketball practice again, right? Friday, I'm just trying to recover from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. And then Saturday, I've got, got to get ready for church on Sunday, right? Well, life gets busy. Life happens, and, and we, we, we forget about the importance of this. I think another reason we we really don't go out and share our faith is simply we don't want to be that that weird person, right? We don't want to be that that weird person that's like, Jesus loves you. (laughs) Can you find another seat, please? Right? You don't want to be that, that guy. And I think probably one of the biggest reasons many of us don't share our faith is often... We simply don't feel like we know enough, right? We feel like, if I just knew more, then I would do it more, Pastor, but I just don't feel confident. But but, but here's the tension that I want you to see. We think, yeah, if I understood the Bible more, if I knew the Bible more, if I'd memorized more verses, I knew the stories better, if I felt more confident in that, if, if I knew more, then I would share my faith. But... Catch what Paul is implying through this prayer. Because that's what he's saying isn't what happens, in fact. What Paul is actually saying is that when you share your faith, then what happens? He says, when you share your faith, then you understand more. What happens is, Paul is praying that we would constantly do what? He's praying that we would constantly share our faith in Jesus. And when we share our faith in Jesus, something very positive begins to happen. Well, of course, lives are impacted. Lives are changed. But more than that happens because our life is, life is impacted. Our faith is changed as well. Now, when you share your faith, it, it might simply be that you're just planting a seed into somebody else's life, right? Maybe you're, you're watering a seed that was already planted there. Maybe... Maybe you'll even get to harvest some point, some point in time. I mean, that, that's an incredible opportunity when that happens. But regardless of where, where that process is with the other person, if you're sharing your faith, God is making a difference in your life as well. Paul is showing that something amazing happens when we share our faith. And that as we share our faith, you actually get to have a, a full understanding of every good thing that you have in Christ, Paul says. Suddenly, as you share your faith, you're, you're growing deeper in your relationship with Jesus. You're falling more and more in love with Jesus as you share your faith. You're beginning to understand more what it, what it means by walking in the Spirit And as you share your faith, and you grow in your faith, you want to share your faith some more. So that you'll grow in your faith some more. So that you can share your faith some more. Do you see how that works? They build. It grows. It's a a, a positive momentum kind of thing. And what happens is, you get a very outward, evangelistic, loving focus towards other people. As believers, as Christ followers, we are called to love God and to love people. Love God and love people. It's really that simple. And then as we do that, then what happens is you you, you want to share your faith more and more and see lives impacted more and more. And then in doing that, your faith is growing deeper and your understanding that you have becomes a broader and you have more of an outward focus from it and then you share this faith and it becomes this very positive thing that's going on inside of you but unfortunately so many times we feel like we don't know enough right that we're not ready 
that we're not good enough, that we might not have the right words. And so we don't share our faith. And then lives aren't impacted. And our life is impacted. And our faith doesn't grow. Because we live in fear. And then we settle into a comfortable Christian bubble of self-navel gazing and reacting against the evil big bad world. And we have no impact on it. We get to a place then where we're no longer sharing our faith and then suddenly our faith is lukewarm and suddenly we begin to wonder, well, why is the world in such a bad place? Well, because we've done nothing to impact it. This is one of the reasons why I believe Paul is praying this for Philemon. As lives are changed as we share our faith, we begin to have this deeper, richer, greater, grander, fuller understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. By doing so, then, it increases our outward focus. We begin to love more. And we begin to build this positive spiritual momentum. Now, I I know and I believe that we are a church of a people of prayer. And, And I love that about our church. We pray for one another. We have... A prayer team that prays fantastically for us. And we have others, we, we pray and, and we open meetings, we have business meetings, we pray, we have deacons meetings, we pray, the women's ministry gather together, they pray. I mean, we, we, we pray. We are a people of prayer. And that's awesome. And, 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 I, and, I, and I encourage in that. And, I, and I'm so glad we have that culture here, that, that we are a people of prayer. And because we are a people of prayer, today I want you to add this to your prayer list. I want you to add this to your prayer life, that, that we are going to begin praying for, for other believers that we love. And we're going to pray this for ourselves as well, that we would begin to or continue to share our faith. Pray for our teenagers, right? They're they're, they're working hard and and inviting their friends at school and inviting friends and the team to come on a a Wednesday night. Kids who are far from God, believe me. I talk with these kids. I I get to give some of these kids a ride home. Uh, I hear the conversations they have. I get to talk with Kevin about some of the things that are going on in the lives of some of our students. There's some issues that these kids have or their families have. And we are getting to be a light into their life. And it's because one kid invited another kid. Pray for those kids that they would continue to invite. And when some kid comes in with a bunch of baggage, they don't go, oh, that was a mistake. I'm never inviting a kid like that again. No, instead he goes, man, I got another friend who needs Jesus too. I'm going to invite that guy next week. Pray for our teenagers. Pray pray for our younger kids, our, our elementary school and preschool age kids, that they would invite their friends. Pray that they would be a light into Rippleside or wherever they're at. Pray for your spouse. When they go to work, pray that God would open doors and create opportunities that, that they would be a light into that community of, believe, of people where they work. Pray for your kids in the cities, your grandkids. Pray for those who love Jesus, that they would be active in sharing their faith in Christ. We are a people of prayer, and we need to add this to our prayer list. But let me give you a bit of a warning. If you begin to pray for this, God is going to give you opportunities to share your faith. Okay? This is a dangerous prayer. God may put you into an uncomfortable situation because you pray this prayer. But that's a good thing. Because it's a chance for you to grow and to come into a deeper understanding of all of the blessings and the great things that we have in Christ Jesus. So I'm praying for you. Pray for me too. Let's pray for one another together and those who we love in Christ. That God would open doors and create opportunities. And that when those opportunities come, we would step into them, we would lean into them, we would take the bull by the horn, step out in faith, even when we're scared, 
and share and love. So that the other person might know, but so that we too might grow. Now what I want to do, and I'm going to wrap up with this, is, is since many people don't feel fully equipped to share faith, I'm going to give you just four real quick, simple ways to share your faith. Based loosely on some stories from the Bible, a couple that we've covered fairly recently as we worked through the book of John. Some, some brief stories that illustrate how we can share our faith. When God gives us those moments, how, how we can respond so that you are adequately prepared to share your faith in this week to come. Because I'm going to be praying that God makes you uncomfortable this week and you get to share your faith. And I want you to be prepared in that. So these are different ways for you to share your faith. Four of them, fairly quickly here. First of all, if you're taking notes, you can be loving, but you can be direct, right? You can be incredibly loving, but there is a time to be direct with people. In fact, in Acts 2, this is precisely what Peter does. He's preaching to thousands of people, but in it, he's loving and very direct. And he, says, uh, he said, that, said to them this, he said, you all need to repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Boom, right? I mean, it doesn't get clearer than that. He's, he's preaching to a bunch of strangers. And he's like, y'all need Jesus. Get baptized. Repent. Let's go. Very, very direct. As direct as possible, in fact. You need to repent of your sins, turn to God, be baptized in the name of Jesus. That's as clear and clean and precise as it could possibly be. And there are times where the Holy Spirit will direct you and lead you in this direction, that if you're obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit, that very direct approach is the way to go. Now, you can't do it that way each and every time, because if, if this is the way, if, if this is your hammer, so to speak, of sharing your faith, people may begin to feel like you're kind of the El Jerko Christian, right? If that's the only way you approach them. It's, it's not necessarily always the most loving methodology, although telling people that they need Jesus is the most loving message you can share. Sometimes we have to work our way into that conversation with them. But, but, but if you want to be more equipped and more prepared in this, there's some great tools and great resources out there. Uh, one that I, I personally have, have quite a bit of experience is, uh, comes from Ray Comfort. It's the Way of the Master system. If you know Kurt Cameron, right? Uh, or uh, uh, Todd Friel. I don't know if you know Todd. Todd used to be a, a radio guy in the Twin Cities. Um, stepped out of the radio system in the Twin Cities to go work full-time for Way of the Masters and I think moved to California for it. And, and those guys have a very confrontational style of, of sharing Jesus with people. And sometimes that is the best way. And if you want to know more, check it out. It's the way of the master, Ray Comfort. Ray is a guy from New Zealand. He's this little, I, I met him once. He's this kind of small little guy, but, but really passionate about sharing Jesus with people and really good at doing it. So, so look that up. Way of the master, Ray Comfort. The second way that you can share your faith, and, and every one of us can do this one. And this is probably, I think, perhaps the most powerful way of sharing faith is simply tell your story. Share your testimony. Pastor Kevin worked for the majority of last year with our teenagers on this very thing. Developing their testimony. Developing the story. It's already your story. You just need to tell it. Share your story. And every time that you share your story, it's a, it, it's a powerful reflection of what Jesus has done. In fact, we, we saw this in John's Gospel in the ninth chapter. It's this amazing story of this guy who was born blind, right? Remember this story? And Jesus comes to him and he opens his eyes so that he can see. And all of a sudden, the Pharisees come and they're debating about what, what had gone on. And they're like, whose fault was it that he was blind? Is it his parents' fault? Did this man sin? What's going on? Why did Jesus heal him on the Sabbath? Jesus has got to be a sinner. Maybe he wasn't really blind. You know, they, they, they bring up all these things. And so they go and they question the guy. A blind guy who can now see is like, I don't know what you guys are talking about. I don't understand the deeper meaning of all this junk you're battering about. All I can tell you, I was blind. And now I can see. You can argue all you want with whatever else you want to say, but if you want to hear my story today, yesterday I couldn't see and today I can. And it was Jesus who did this. For most of us, telling our story 
That's our greatest, most powerful tool. I mean, some of us, it's like, right? All I know is I, I used to be an addict, right? But because of Jesus, I'm not. I used to be hurting, but because of Jesus, now I have peace. All I know is I, I used to be lost, but because of Jesus, now I'm found. And so you, you tell your story. And then some of us have this like crazy, wild, wild story, right? Like, like I, I, I used to smoke weed. I used to drink whiskey. I used to shoot heroin. But then Jesus saved me, right? And for most of us, it's not quite that dramatic. It's more like I used to smoke Cheetos and drink NyQuil and shoot squirrels. But <laughs> still, you can share your story, Right? And, and truly, though, it's amazing how as you begin to share your story, how you begin to tell your version of what God has done in your life and, and, and what He's doing in your life, it is amazing how just telling your story will impact other people. It's amazing how often you'll just begin to tell your story and immediately find overlapping with what this other person has begun to experience. Oh, I, I lost a child too. Oh, I, I, I had a miscarriage once. So, oh, yeah, I went to the church and oh, it was, they, they weren't nice to me. They were mean. They were judgmental. They were real jerks to me, right? And as you begin to share your experiences, I had that happen to me. Oh, you did. I had that happen to me too. As you begin to share, you begin to make these connections and God works in the midst of that and does amazing things simply by you sharing your story. So you can be loving and you can be direct and you can share your story. The third thing is very simple. You can invite people to church. Now, this isn't always the best because people do have baggage when it comes to church, right? They've had a bad experience and for you to invite them to church, some people are like, I don't know about that. I went once and had a bad experience. I don't know if I want to go back to that, right? There are, there are people with baggage, but it's still, inviting people to church is still an effective tool. And it doesn't really get much easier than this. I mean, it's as simple as, hey, what are you doing Sunday morning? Well, I was going to be sleeping. Why don't you come to church with me and I'll buy you lunch afterwards? Always buy them lunch, by the way, right? Buying lunch is important. And then tip the waiter well, or server or waitress, whatever you got. But... Hey, just come to church with me Sunday. My family's going, I'll stop and pick you up even if you need a ride. Then we'll buy you lunch afterwards, I'll bring you home. If you don't like it, well, fine. But just give it a try. Come, come join me for a week. But it's that easy, in fact. And essentially, that's, that's what a woman does in the Gospel of John that we, we study back in John chapter 4, right? Jesus has this interaction with a Samaritan woman. Remember this? A sinful woman. Uh, she's... A woman that no Jewish man in his right mind should be having any interaction with in that culture. Yet, in the story here, we find him loving this woman. And he says to her, Lady, you've had five husbands, and now you're shacking up with some guy you're not even married to. And she's like, How does he know all this about me? And he basically says, Lady, you are thirsting for something more. But you just keep drinking kind of this boring old regular water, and it's not doing it for you. And Jesus says, I will give you the living water. And with the living water, you will never thirst again. And she's so moved by this. What she does, she runs back into town, back into her community, back to the place where everybody knows who she is. And she says, come and see this man who told me about every bad thing that I've done, but just come and see him, man. Just come. Just come with me. Just, just, just come. She doesn't actually offer to buy them lunch, but she says, come. Come with me and meet this guy. That, that's what we can all do. Just come with me. Just come to church. Just give it a try, right? I do this one all the time. I, I invite people to church all the time, and I'm telling you, it can actually be a little bit awkward as a pastor because it's like, come to church and hear me speak. A little weird, isn't it? Right? And in fact, you know, I, I've told stories of this. My, my entry point in conversations with people is never that I'm a pastor. Now, I'm honest about being a pastor if we get to a point where somebody asks me if I'm a pastor or somebody identifies me as a pastor. But generally, when I'm having a conversation with people, that's not where I try to start the conversation. Because for a lot of people, 
that, that erects walls. And so I, I just talk with people, and I'll invite people to church. You know, again, if they ask, oh, are you the pastor? You want staff there? I'm, yeah, yeah, I am actually, but that's beside the point. Come to church anyhow. I'm not inviting you on my behalf. It's not like I get some bonus if you show up. Just, just come. Give it a try. Come meet these nice people that I get to hang out with every week, right? They'll, they'll love you. They'll, they'll serve you. They'll pray for you. So, a little bit awkward as pastor, but nonetheless, I'm going to keep on doing it. Invite somebody to church. The fourth and final thing, if you're taking notes, is this. You can live a life that other people want. Every one of us can do this. You can live a life that other people want. In fact, Paul and Silas, they did this, right? Uh, in, in a crazy story you can read about in the book of Acts, Paul and Silas get arrested. They're in jail. And what do these crazy guys do? What do these Jesus followers do in the middle of sitting in jail? They're right there, shackled up, nowhere to go, nothing to do. They're like, worship service, right? How many of you, that's your first thought when you get arrested? How many of you have been arrested? Maybe I should ask that question. <laughs> that's what Paul and Silas do, right? They're sitting in jail. Time to have some worship. Let's get our worship going, right? So they're, 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 they're singing, they're, whatever they're doing, they're, they're, they're worshiping in there. And, and like the jailer's looking in on them, they're like, most people aren't worshiping God when they get arrested. What's with these dudes? And suddenly, like this earthquake comes. God sends it. And the, and the jail doors bust open, like the walls are crumbling, the doors pop open, and, and, and all these guys who've been arrested, they could just be set free and, and then run off. And, and, and the jailer's like, oh no, these guys are all going to run away, and if they're not here in the morning when my boss shows up, he's going to kill me. I might as well, I mean, he's, he's literally thinking, I might as well kill myself now. And Paul's like, buddy, don't kill yourself. Don't do that. We're still in here, even though the door popped open. We're still here. No, no, it's cool. We're still in here. Don't, don't, don't worry, man. And then this guy, is, I mean, like his mind is blown. He's like, why didn't you guys run away? I mean, you, you could have just, you know, taken off. Why, why did you stay here? And he basically looks at them and he's like, whoa. I heard you worshiping, you're celebrating, you had a chance to run, you didn't. What do you have? What's going on in you? Why are you so different, right? And then he asked this question, what must I do to be saved? He knows there's something greater going on in their lives from having seen the way that they live. I want what you guys have. And there's some people here in our church that, that live with God in such a way that, that it radiates His love, right? People who, you know, you, you get that diagnosis, you've got cancer, I still love Jesus, right? And you have peace through it. And, and other people on the outside are like, how did you do that? How did you survive that? I would have been angry at God. No, I was praising God, right? How did you do that? People begin to ask questions when you don't react the way that they are expecting. When you begin to live in a way that's different than the culture that surrounds you, people begin to take notice. And what I know about our culture is that our culture is hungry and it's seeking. And when people see that you have something different, that you have something better, that you have something greater, they want to know what it is that you have. Why? So that they can have it too, right? So live in a way that radiates the glory of Jesus Christ so that we will have a deeper, richer understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. That's going to be my prayer for you this week. I'm going to pray that God's going to present opportunities, that you're going to live in ways that you're going to share your story, that, that all of these different things, one of them is going to click, one of them is going to happen so that you will have an opportunity to share your faith with somebody this week. And I would challenge you each and every day this week to do the same. To pray, God, give us an opportunity to share our faith. 
And I believe if you will pray that, that He will honor that and He will do that. He will give you opportunities to share your faith. So be warned. I'm praying that for you this week. I'm praying that God throws a grenade into your comfortable life that gives you a chance to tell somebody about Jesus. And I'm praying every day that God will give you the power and give you the boldness and give you the encouragement you need when that opportunity comes to step forward into it and to share your story or to be up right to the point sometimes. But I'm praying that our church would be active in sharing our faith so that when we do that, we will see lives changed, but our life will be changed as well and be enriched in faith as we follow Jesus so that we will have a deeper understanding of every good thing that we have in Christ. Let's do that this week. Pray with me.